Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on Seed of Power. I'm Emily and I'm here today with amazing guest. Her name is Dr. Paula Kahumbu and she is a conservationist. Uh, you know, she works with all sorts of amazing animals all around the world. So we're going to talk about her story and how she got there. So come on in. Thanks, Emily. Thank you for joining us. So I think that everybody should hear a little bit about your background and how you came to be the conservationist that you are. Well, I was born and raised in Kenya and grew up just outside of the city. In those days, there was a lot of wildlife. There were animals everywhere in our garden, you know, there were from monkeys to giraffes and buffaloes and all kinds of animals. And uh, by the time I'd finished high school, I had been into the wild, been on expeditions, fallen in love with animals, and I knew what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a ranger. Mm -hmm. And that's where it started. And of course, a ranger is not like, considered like the most prestigious job in the world. And I was instead encouraged to get into science and, and to do research. And so I went on, I did my undergraduate and my graduate degree um, courses in ecology and biology and geography and ended up using the academic background and expertise to really be a champion for animals. And I've chosen elephants as really the most important. I did my PhD research in elephants because at, at the time elephants were declining at such a rate that it was it was inevitable they were going to go extinct. That's what I thought. Um, and we managed to turn things around. And having that success coming from a country like Kenya really uh, gave me the confidence that conservation matters, it's possible to turn things around, and, and we have this important duty. Absolutely. So yeah. that's incredible. What an accomplishment. Can you tell us a little bit about what went into turning that around? You know, if, if you sense an approaching extinct extinction, I can only right. imagine there's a lot of work. Well, for elephants, it's a very, very peculiar problem. The uh, people in various parts of the world, especially in Asia, China, Japan, um, Thailand, Philippines, even here in the United States and in Europe, have this lust for ivory. So they wear it in pendants and jewelry, carvings. And it's, it's deemed to be something so important because it brings prestige to the owner. And in Japan in particular, it's deemed to bring luck. And so the killing of elephants is really around providing ivory to people in parts of the world, uh, people who buy it. So turning it around means tackling that problem, mm -hmm. not just the, the demand of so people's passions and fashions that are, are driving this demand, but also dealing with the illegal crime that is taking place. What Kenya did in 1989 was actually take the entire ivory stockpile and say, this is worth millions of dollars and we're going to set it aflame. We're just going to burn it. It's a massive bonfire because we think elephants are worth more alive. Wow. And that sent a shockwave around the world that how could a poor country in Africa decide instead of turning that into cash and using the cash for anti-poaching, we instead said we don't want anything more to do with ivory trade. It's hugely symbolic. It was so important that a ban on international trade in ivory took place. And all around the world, ivory shops were shut down. Nobody could buy or sell ivory and elephant populations recovered. And so I was so proud as a Kenyan that we did this mm -hmm. and our elephants were safe and our elephants had dropped from 180,000 down to 16,000 and now they were recovering. And it was such a moment of great you know, achievement for Kenya and all Kenyans who were involved in it. Uh, and sadly in 2002 and again in 2008, countries around the world made a very, very poor decision to reopen trade in ivory. And they said, let's do it as an experiment which just seems so cruel. How do, you, how do you do an experiment on animals that are so majestic as elephants and, and so like human beings? They did this experiment. They sold some ivory from four southern African countries to Japan and then later on to Japan and China. And it just unleashed this demand that nobody can now contain. It seems to be almost impossible. The, the demand is so huge that if all Chinese people who wanted ivory could get what they wanted, the elephants in Africa would be finished in a, in a year. But because it was made, um, it was a one-off sale, it's not like legal, ongoing trade, but it, what it did was triggered the killing of elephants. And today we're losing elephants at a rate of one every 15 minutes. Wow. And that means that in our lifetimes, we could actually uh, see elephants disappear from the wild. So how many are left right now, as far as we know? The, the latest research suggests there's some, somewhere like 400,000 elephants left okay. in Africa. Um, they're declining at a rate of 8% per year. So literally by the year 2030, they could be gone from the wild. So this is a project that you're not ever going to be finished with. You're, this, you're going to continue your work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
we could, we could stop all the demand for ivory, uh, let's say we did it by tomorrow. The problem is that elephants have, are so traumatized. Just think of it, every time an elephant is killed, it's usually uh, a matriarch, so one of the most important powerful individuals in the, in the community of elephants. And it leaves behind all these shattered families of elephants. So there's a lot of work to be done on not just stopping the poaching, but securing the landscapes, making elephants safe from all the other threats. Of course, climate change is a big challenge. There is human wildlife conflict because elephants need to roam over very large areas to survive. So there's a huge amount of work. But right now, we really are um, most concerned about the poaching because that is the cause of the fastest um, decline that elephants have ever experienced in history. So presumably you've spent a significant amount of time with elephants. Can you tell us a story you've, you've had with one or a, a particular experience that really stands out? Uh, <laughs> I've, I've spent a lot of time with elephants, <laughs> years actually. And they always, always surprise me with how intelligent and aware they are. When I was doing my PhD, I worked in a forest uh, in the coast of Kenya, and I was studying these particular bizarre elephants because they lived in the forest and they were altering the nature of the, the biodiversity in that forest. So I would go into the forest. I had a child, I, w I had a two-year-old baby. And I don't know why, I, when I think of it today, I would never do it again, but I took him with me into the field. And he would sit on a mat while I and my team would work and we were measuring trees. And I remember on this particular day, we were out there for hours and we were measuring trees and I kept looking, Joshua was sitting there doing his, drawing his pictures. And then I noticed this tree was moving. <laughs> and it wasn't a tree, it was an elephant. And the elephants had walked in and they were standing around us. It was very bizarre, they were just sleeping. They had walked in while we were working, we hadn't noticed them, and they were so silent and then they'd all gone to sleep. And it was this bizarre moment of, wow, they're just as comfortable um, about you know, being here with us, that they, they don't feel at all at risk. But we had to quietly, you know, back backtrack and pack up and leave before they woke up. Um, and I just remembered thinking that they knew we were not dangerous. They weren't worried. They didn't attack us. Uh, they just came and went to sleep with us. And they can walk that quietly? Oh yeah, they have, they have the most amazing biology. Their feet are like huge padded cushions and they walk very, very silently. That's incredible. Yeah. So this is very timely that you're here in the US right now, leading up to World Elephant Day. So right. can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing um, here in the US and what you're talking about and what the focus of your trip is? So first, I'm really excited to be here in New York. This is a wonderful opportunity uh, for Wildlife Direct, my organization in partnership with Amarula, to raise awareness about the plight of elephants. And we've chosen New York because New York really is the heart of <laughs> the world's economies, really. Um, ivory trade is, is a global issue, and we are Africans, Kenyans and South Africans working together to bring global awareness to this crisis. So we are going to unveil a 10-foot or life-sized elephant sculpture made out of ice, and it's going to be placed in Union Square in Manhattan in the summer heat on Saturday the 12th of August, so World Elephant Day. And we're going to invite the public to come and join us and to learn about elephants. And as the, as the day goes on, that ice sculpture is going to melt. And basically the idea is that we want to raise attention to the disappearing of elephants. You know, the campaign name is Don't Let Them Disappear. We want people to witness and, you know, this, this very sad and tragic, it's almost like tears. I mean, this thing is going to melt in front of your eyes uh, as a symbol of the disappearing elephants in Africa. So what is one thing about your career or about this campaign that you wish you could tell people if, if you can't possibly speak with everybody who stops by this weekend? What, what is you know, one overarching lesson you'd love to share? So probably, <laughs> I've got several, but <laughs> the most important one, honestly, it's that people really should not buy ivory. Right? Anybody who buys ivory, uses ivory or has ivory is in some way helping the slaughter of elephants. It's part of the problem. So just last week, the US government crushed a ton of ivory in, Times, in a central, central park. Mm. And, and that was a global message, very similar to what Kenya has done. I, I want Americans to know that they shouldn't be buying ivory or owning ivory or keeping ivory. Um, that I think is really, really important. But there's a great opportunity right now. Amarula um, 
has made a huge commitment towards saving elephants and they've said that for every bottle of Amarula bought in this country between September and the end of December, we'll, they will make a, don a dollar donation to Wildlife Direct and that allows us to do our work on the ground. And this is really important because we work in the courtrooms addressing the criminal justice system. We're going after the ivory traffickers. These are global criminal cartels. Some of them are actually in jail here in the United States. So this is not something that is local to Africa or local to Kenya, it's actually global. Um, any support that enables us to catch people who are wanted, some of them are wanted by Interpol, any support that enables us to make sure that the court system works properly, people get prosecuted and jailed and sent to jail for a significant amount of time, sends a strong message across the continent that it's not worth it, it's not worth poaching, it's not worth trafficking, the penalties are too severe, the likelihood of being caught are very high. So I want everybody in this country to know that and to support what we're doing. They can go to amarula.com and find out more about the campaign and they can come to the wildlifedirect.org website which allows you to see more about what we do as an organisation and you can support us in many ways including making a donation on that site. Fantastic. Well, your career has been incredible. You've you know, made such a difference in, from the very beginning of this conversation, the stories you told, and I'm sure you will continue to do so. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.